live from KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. Oh, I know you can feel an excitement growing for tomorrow's annular eclipse, but not everybody is looking forward to the event. Why some in Bandera County are worried about the crowds. Opioid and other substance ad addictions have torn families apart across our country. Now a local nonprofit that served San Antonio for decades spreading a message in hopes of change this weekend. We've got a preview. But first tonight, we got to talk about the weather. Yeah, and it's not just the sun. It's also cooler temperatures yes. and an eclipse this weekend. Adam. A lot going on. The cold front has just passed through town. It did spark off one downpour on the east side of Bear County and San Antonio. But let's talk about the eclipse, the all important forecast for cloud cover. When it comes to viewing an eclipse, nothing matters more than cloud cover. Some clouds are likely to redevelop tonight locally and especially along the Rio Grande and farther south down I-35. However, as we go through the morning, as we so often see around here, the clouds should slowly start to break up and dissipate. I think it's going to take longer as you get closer to the Rio Grande, closer to the border there. But during peak eclipse times, I think we'll have pretty good viewing around San Antonio, so immediate surrounding areas, and especially up into the hill country off I-10. It's farther west you go, uh, closer to the border, where I think the view is going to be obscured by more clouds, and south down I-35, where I think you'll have more issues with clouds obscuring the eclipse. So this is what I'm thinking about. As it begins, we'll still have some clouds out there, 1023 AM here in San Antonio. But then as we get closer to max eclipse, at 1154, that's when a lot of those clouds will start to break up and dissipate. And I think we'll have good viewing for the eclipse. Perfect viewing, maybe not, but we'll still have pretty good viewing for it. I'm not traveling anywhere. I'm going to stay right here. I think it'll be good enough. And then by the time it ends, our sky is completely cleared out. Here's another way to look at it. 10 a.m. partly cloudy. By 1150, we're clearing out. And notice that temperature drop. I think we'll notice a little temperature drop as that uh, eclipse is underway. We'll talk more about this cold front, what it means for the wind, humidity, and how much cooler it's going to get in a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. As the eclipse approaches smaller communities across south central Texas, they have some concerns, and mostly it's over capacity. Yeah, like the town of Vanderpool, it's in Bandera County. Leaders there say that about 1,500 people live there, but tomorrow it could see more than 10,000 people. Yeah, the night team's Avery Everett spent the day in Bandera County where community members say they're actually preparing for this like they would a natural disaster. Yeah, we're a small community and we're kind of setting our ways here. Tonight, the town of Vanderpool sits quiet. Quiet, yes. But tomorrow, that could all change. We're treating it like kind of like a flood. Only it's not going to flood, it's going to be people. County officials predict thousands of people could pack this town as the eclipse crosses over Bandera County. We've had every kind of projection there is. In a community built with a capacity of 2,000, this eclipse and the people passing through could drain their resources dry. The roadways are actually some of the biggest concerns when it comes to Bandera County leaders ahead of this weekend. They're worried that if people try to park in these narrow to non-existent shoulders, that traffic, it's only going to build up. We're worried about people coming in and getting off on side roads and whatever, or blocking the roads where we can't run emergency traffic. We're worried about emergencies and being able to take care of the people that are here. Just one gas station and one country store is all that's here. Correct. Preparations have taken two years. We brought in more. And stocking the shelves has taken two months. Probably will run low on gas uh, and diesel, but uh, we'll go as far as we can go. If you're headed to Bandera County, officials recommend getting gas before you head in, packing enough food to last you through the night, and to expect cell service to be slow. We're concerned with safety. If you're not already here, expect traffic along the way, as trailers and RVs have been rolling in since early morning. I think they're full for the weekend already. Leaders see this as a test run ahead of April when the county is expecting 50,000 people to cross through for the 2024 total eclipse. The crosshairs are right up the road about five miles. As this town fills up tonight, <sighs> county leaders say concern for tomorrow is top of mind. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Into the Middle East now in a mass exodus from northern Gaza after Israel's military urged citizens to flee that area ahead of an expected ground invasion. Israeli's defense minister vowing to destroy Hamas infrastructure and headquarters. The retaliatory strikes come in response to Saturday's attack by Hamas terrorists that killed thousands, injured thousands more. 
27 Americans killed in those attacks in Israel tonight. The White House says President Biden has spoken to the families of 14 Americans who are still unaccounted for. A teenager is in jail tonight after a routine traffic stop turned into something a lot bigger. So we want to show you some packages, two of those that you see right there on that table. They contained about 40,000 pills that tested positive for fentanyl. 19-year-old Brian, Brian Betancourt is facing a felony charge of possession and intent to deliver. Deputies with the Bear County Sheriff's Office say that they found the pills earlier this month on San Pedro near Jackson, Keller, and Oblate. Now, although this was a win for law enforcement, it's a really scary indication of the trend that the BCSO is seeing. The Bear County Sheriff's Office seized enough fentanyl uh, to kill half the residents of Bear County. That's over a million people that could have died based upon the fentanyl that we seized in 2021. Uh, Sheriff Javier Salazar also has another problem, and that is that deputies are finding more potent doses of fentanyl in the pills that they're taking off the streets. I also want to remind you, in light of all this, the Souls of Walking for Souls happening tomorrow at Brook City Base at the Green Line, a chance to learn about the dangers of fentanyl and other substances. Our Courtney Friedman will MC that event. It goes from 4 until 8 o'clock. There'll be music, food trucks, and an opportunity to learn how to save lives. To register, visit ksatcommunity.com. So also something that's happening tomorrow, Hemisphere Park is going to be the backdrop for the Light the Night event that supports the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. KSAT, along with our community partners, are sponsoring the event. Our own Lee Waltman is actually going to be the MC this year. The festivities start at 6 o'clock, and you see that QR code to the right of your screen? Scan it, because once you do that, you'll go on a website where you're going to get more information about the event. Do you know these people? New Braunfels police say those three were seen on security video using credit cards that came from a wallet stolen from an HEB parking lot. If you know these people or know anything that could help police find them, you're asked to call Comal County Crime Stoppers. That number 830-620-8477. You can get a reward of up to $4,000 if they can track these people down. Now on to national news. House Republicans picking Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio as their new speaker nominee. Now, you know, the House has essentially been paralyzed after Kevin McCarthy's historic outing. But right now, it's still unclear, though, if Jordan can actually win the 217 votes that he needs in order to be House Speaker. As a matter of fact, there are already signs that Jordan is going to encounter some resistance. More than a thousand new jobs expected to be coming to San Antonio with the arrival of a major agricultural equipment manufacturer. This morning, city and county leaders announced JCB expanding to San Antonio. City officials say JCB is the world's largest privately owned equipment manufacturing company. Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Peter Sakai say it's expected to have a $30 billion impact over 10 years. It'll also bring more than 1,500 new jobs here. Texas is in a great place. You know, it's central to the country, great port access, a great pro-business climate. I'd hope that other companies take notice of the incredible opportunities on the south side with the IH-35 corridor, with obviously Union Pacific and the railroad. Um, we just have a lot of great assets, and it's time to reinvest in the south side, and this company is doing it. I'm excited about it. This will be the company's second North American location. The plant will be built on 400 acres of land on the south side. It is a group that serves San Antonio for decades, and this weekend they are hosting a big event for people who are trying to get back on track with their lives. We've got a preview. Opioids, meth, alcohol, and other substances are really taking a toll on young people in the community. But here's the thing. It's also affecting their families. Yeah, it affects all of us, really. The 19th's Patty Santos talks to peer counselors at Rise Recovery who have themselves walked in the same shoes and are now extending a helping hand. My first experience with substances, um, I was 15 years old um, and I struggled a lot. I ended up homeless. I ended up living under a bridge on the south side. Um, I ended up getting, getting arrested a couple times. Addiction is their past. Now these three are using their experience to help others who come to Rise Recovery. One of my goals when I first started working here was to try to be somebody 
that I wish I had in my life when I was a teenager. The nonprofit has served the San Antonio community for 45 years, providing help to youth, young adults, and their families struggling with drugs and alcohol. We find that Rise Recovery is absolutely a lifeline for people who have run out of options. And CEO Evita Morin says getting support for treatment is expensive, but at Rise Recovery, help is free. If you are a concerned parent, this is a wonderful place to start, to be educated, to learn the signs and symptoms of substance use. This Saturday, the organization is hosting its inaugural Rice Fest, a sober, family-friendly fun event. This is a fundraiser and a friend raiser for Rise Recovery so that you can, so we can learn a little bit about you all and you can learn a little bit about what we do for the community. Maureen says people and families who are struggling with addiction should see this as a sign. Parents, trust your gut. If you see a behavior, don't dismiss it as just age-related stuff or growing pains. Ask questions, look around, don't walk on eggshells around this issue. Patty Santos, Case at 12 News. I like what she said. It's a fundraiser and a friend raiser. Rise Fest tomorrow from 2 to 7 p.m. at 2803 Moss Rock. If you don't know where that's, where that is, it's near Vance Jackson and Loop 410. On a lighter note, it is hard to believe that we're already in the middle of October. So you know what that means. The Los Muertos Festival just around the corner. It's happening October 28th and 29th at Hemisphere Park. Scan that QR code on your screen to get tickets and learn more about all the fun events. Absolutely. Can't believe it. Just a few weeks away. We're already talking about that. And, and you know, I love the fact my two favorite months in San Antonio, April, October. Yeah. Fiesta. Because of weather. It was. Oh, I was like, oh, Fiesta. Fiesta is nice, and went but the here. weather's very nice yes. usually yeah. those it, months. And it can go either way these those yep. two months, yep. yes. And uh, now we're seeing that shift with the north wind now. Changes are happening. The fall-like air is moving in. Take a look at our morning low temperature trend for the days ahead. This is first thing in the morning at sunrise, 62 tomorrow. By Sunday morning, 55. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're talking mornings in the upper 40s to low 50s sweatshirt weather for the kids at the bus stop. Let's talk about tomorrow in detail. We'll start with the low clouds early at sunrise, gradually, gradually breaking up as we approach the eclipse time. Still a few passing clouds around the eclipse, but as I said before, should be pretty good viewing here in San Antonio. Notice 11 a.m. 67, noon down to 62 because of the moon blocking the sun, and then we gradually climb back up and make it to 79 for the high temperature with total sunshine into the afternoon. Sunday, similar afternoon, 77 degrees. That's the temperature right now. So the cool air is still lagging behind this front a little bit, but the dew point is plummeted down to 51. Deweys are dropping and they're dropping fast with that north wind. Still waiting for the humidity to drop south of Highway 90. Carrizo Springs, Kennedy, Victoria and southward still dew points in the 70s. Give it a few hours. That changes. Drier air is quickly plunging southward. So the wind is picking up, pushing in that drier air. It's just the cooler air we're still waiting on to really notice that, that difference in the cooler air. Wind gusts tonight through tomorrow morning up to 30, 35 miles per hour, basically through the first half of the day tomorrow. And then that wind subsides tomorrow evening. I mentioned the cooler air being farther behind the front, not immediately here as the front moves in. North Texas temperatures in the 60s. Panhandle right near 50, 40s, and even some 30s further up the plains, and that cooler air is going to be pushing in. We're not going to drop down into the 30s. As I showed you, the lowest will go is upper 40s by Tuesday morning, but still, you'll, you'll feel the changes and notice them this weekend. Fall-like temperatures actually below average, and notice those high temperatures holding steady in the upper 70s through a good chunk of next week. All right, Adam, thank you. So yesterday, uh, Larry was telling us to get our popcorn ready. Yeah, absolutely. For this Reagan Johnson football oh, game, game, get your popcorn ready for sure. It's a battle for first place in that district. This game went back and forth until the very end. We got your highlights coming up. Plus, the Spurs beat the Heat. Sohan is back, and Wimby, well, he's jamming. Coming up. Construction crew, and, and we're, we're here to deconstruct the Jags. Yeah! That is.
is awesome. Johnson and Reagan is the big game in our big game coverage this week. Two undefeated teams going head to head in District 28 6A, Mary. And here is where the big game is going down. Hero Stadium located off of Roarsbach Parkway. And what a beautiful night for high school football between the second ranked Reagan Rattlers and number three Johnson Jaguars. All right, Reagan brought their own construction crew to this one because as they just said, they were there to deconstruct the Jags. Let's see if they did that first quarter. Jags are down seven to nothing about the score. The handoff goes to Lauren Johnson. He just refuses to get tackled using one hand to stay up and that's a 14 yard touchdown. And this game is tied at seven. Second quarter, well, it starts to rain. More action now, tied to 13. Rattlers QB Brad Jackson scrambling to his right, then he throws the ball to Michael Isgetti for the end zone touchdown, 25 yards, Rattlers, and they go up 20 to 13. This was a great back and forth football game. Late fourth quarter, Isgetti scores to make it 40 to 27, Rattlers, and the Reagan Rattlers win this game 41 27 to take this battle of two versus number three, but their quarterback isn't letting them get too far ahead of themselves. I mean, I'm going to let my, my let myself and my teammates celebrate this one tonight. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now it's all business, you know, back again tomorrow. We've got to come in for, for treatment and, you know, work, work out. We're focusing on Churchill next week, and we got to be 1-0 and next week. And then, you know, we just got to take it one day at a time, one practice at a time, and keep it one game at a time, and then look, and then hopefully we'll look up and we'll see ourselves in, in December playing for hopefully a state championship. Once again, that district title goes through Reagan. The student section of Lenoff Stadium was jam-packed and lively as usual, where the Steel Knights are playing the San Marcos Rattlers. Steel was looking to improve to 2-0 in District 27-6A. Second quarter, Knights ball. Chad Warner gives it to Jonathan Hatton. He breaks off a 15-yard touchdown run, and the Steel Knights lead 14-0. Later in the quarter, give the ball to Sammy Harris, please, and then he bounces off the pile, dives into the end zone. Steel extends their lead 21-0, and Steel rose 45-6, improving to 6-1 overall, 2-0 in district play. Time to do some push-ups at Randolph for the fifth-ranked Rohawks. We're playing Ingram Moore, first quarter. Rohawks up 7-6 to six with the ball. Quarterback Colin Stuckey throws down the field to Lee McMuhan for a big gain down to the 15-yard line. Moments later, the same two finish off the drive. Stuckey to McMuhan for a sweet grab in the end zone. 30-yard touchdown. Randolph leads it 14-6, to six and Randolph takes it 14-6. to six. Here's wrestling legend Bill Goldberg greeting the seventh-ranked champion Chargers ahead of their game with the Wagner Thunderbirds at Rutledge Stadium. First quarter, T-Birds get on the board first. Handoff goes to Jamari Jones and he scores a 37-yard touchdown and into 7 to nothing. Wagner still in the first quarter. Champion is punting the ball away. It hits off a Thunderbird. Ricochets into the end zone where it's recovered by Hudson Simmons for a touchdown, and this game is tied at 7. And Wagner goes on to beat Champion by a final of 34 to 21. Out at Southwest Legacy, the Titans are coming off of a tough district loss to Martin, and tonight was going to be another tough task. The top birds in District 13 5A D1, the Southside Cardinals looking to make it seven straight wins. Just before halftime, QB Caden Keith rolls to his right and floats one to the back of the end zone for the short TD toss to Noah Ramirez. And the Cardinal defense was also putting on a show. Check out this hit by Josiah Reyna. That kind of hitting Ooh. would lead to a 36 to nothing victory for Southside. Out at Somerset, the ninth ranked Bulldogs eyeing two district wins in a row, hosting Fredericksburg, the Billies in pup formation. And the Somerset special teams blocks the punt. Brandon Kebb got his hands in on it and it bounces around a few times before Nathan Flores recovers it, putting the Bulldogs in great field position that would set up QB Colby Isbell. He fakes the screen pass and throws a beauty of a ball to Jaden Foz for the 41 yard touchdown as the Bulldogs would go on to win it 28 to 21. Buckle up for this one. It's a heavy weight bout between two district 14 5 AD2 programs Alamo Heights and Harlandale both undefeated. Mules come out swinging QB Colin Ernst to the 30, to the 40, until Rene Cantu brings him down near midfield. Later in the drive, it's Ernst on the keeper. He uses his speed to split the defense for a trip to pay dirt. This was a one possession game at one point until Alamo Heights ran away with it, of course, 60 
to 34. When we say a student section was rocking, this is what we mean. The South San Luchador is part of the theme tonight. Out to the field just before halftime, Laredo Nixon driving and QB Ray Gonzalez airs one out to a wide open Thomas Limon for 25 yard touchdown to tie this to 21. This one will go back and forth all night, but Laredo Nixon gets the last laugh winning 36 28 in double overtime. Even the youngest Lanier fans were fired up for their showdown against Brackenridge at the SAISD Sports Complex third quarter. Vokes going with the Wildcat as Marquise Dixon weaves his way through the Brack D 14 yard touchdown run. Extra point made it 42 0 Lanier as the Vokes dominated this one, winning 55 to 7. All right, bringing the action now to Benson 66 Stadium. Central Catholic playing host to number eight Antonian. Apaches in the red zone running back. Landon Prouty takes the handoff. He goes to the outside and barrels through a couple of tackles for an extra yard or two. Then Jace Toscano hits Raleigh Strode in the corner of the end zone for six. Antonian wins this one in dominant fashion, 40 to zero. Four and two, Jefferson takes on 12th ranked Burbank, who is five and one overall at Alamo Stadium. Bulldogs QB Kevin Hernandez wheels his way to the five before he's taken down by a sea of blue jerseys. This time, Hernandez quick pass to Izzy Zapata, and Zapata does the rest up the middle and tackled across the goal line for the touchdown. Burbank wins the district battle 41 to 13. The Madison Mavericks visited Marshall looking to snap a two game losing streak, but the tough running of the Rams had other ideas. Five yards out, they hand that off to Julian Leha, who just breaks the plane, making it a 13 to 14 game as the Rams rolled in this one 33 to 20. We've still got another segment to go still to come. The BGC road trip stops in Hondo and Medina Valley High School. Plus the Spurs are home playing the Heat. Yes, but but before we go, let's listen to the Warren High School band from their homecoming performance last night. Welcome back. It's time for the BGC road trip to saw Fotogetti Latigo make stops in Hondo and then Medina Valley High School. We start with the Hondo versus Lytle district matchup where a spirited crowd filled the stands of Berry Field on homecoming nights. <laughs> We have both programs ranked as they enter the game with identical 5-1 records. Opening kickoff, explosive start for the Owls. Ryan Gillum finds the open seam along the outside, and he is gone. The senior soaking up the moment as he gives Hondo the early lead with a 73-yard kickoff return for the Tutty. Now to Castroville, where the Medina Valley parents getting in on the halftime entertainment. Awesome. <laughs> Look at the moves on this guy. Love it. He's feeling it. All right. The Panthers hosting 10th ranked Southwest Medina Valley QB. Michael Newton goes deep and wide out Carter Hewitt makes the 30 yard diving touchdown catch. What a throw. What a play. Here's how those two games played out. Hondo lights it up on homecoming night by defeating Lytle 42 to 14. Meanwhile, Southwest took down Benita Valley 12 to 9. All right, here's some other scores for you tonight. Smith Valley beats Mac 62 to nothing. Bernie over Memorial 42 to zip. And in three more scores, we've got uh, Lavernia beating Floresville 63-28. Bandera just edges out Pearsall 26 to 22. And Jordanton all over Crystal City 34 to 6. For all of your scores tonight, please head on over to BigGameCoverage.com or the BGC app. Mary? It's the second preseason game for the Spurs tonight, and they defeat Miami 120 to 104. San Antonio is one and one in preseason. Wemby put up 23 points, 10 for 15 shooting, while Devin Vassell put up 21 for himself. The alien, right? That's what they call Wimby. Is that, is that what they're calling the him? Alien, I, I think, because I, of LeBron James. I don't, I don't know what they call him. I think he's gonna be pretty good. He's just a good basketball <laughs> yeah. player. I'll tell you, he had some really good plays, and, and it was yeah. awesome to see Jeremy Sohan back on the court. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be right back. All right, check out the weekend. A lot of sunshine, especially once we get to midday tomorrow. Cooler, a little bit breezy, less humid, decent viewing around here for the eclipse. Just some passing clouds here and there. Have a great weekend.